How about these other speakers? Yeah. I, I don't know how I'm going to follow up Nigel's talk, um, but here we are. Um, I want to appreciate everybody at OpenVizConf and pretty much everybody that I've spoken to. Uh, this is uh, my first time speaking publicly um, by myself. So yeah, it's a huge honor that, that you guys uh, want to have me here and happy to talk about stuff now and uh, later. Um, so I'm going to get started with uh, maybe shooting myself in the foot. Unlike everybody else, this is a Google Doc presentation. So you can actually go to that link and follow along with me on the slideshow if you want. I've kind of annotated more stuff in the slides. There's more links and other goodies hidden in there if uh, you happen to be on your laptop. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk sounds pretty highfalutin, and it's going to start pretty highfalutin. But it's, it's a very uh, dear and, and kind of normal thing to me that I'm trying to kind of work through. And that's the human side to being a digital practitioner, uh, you know, making stuff on a computer and uh, trying to find human qualities in that. So I want to start actually by going back a little bit. Does anybody know what this is? Not a pipe. <laughs> right, it's not a pipe. Or maybe it is a pipe. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And, and actually, the point that I want to introduce my talk with this slide is not so much what it is or what it isn't. Um, but you know, d d despite the fact that we can argue about the meaning, uh, I think we can all agree that a person made this. Uh, that person is Rene Magritte. He made this when he was 30 years old, uh, 1928, 1929. And I find it so fascinating that, that an object, an inanimate object, can have kind of human qualities. Um, if you go and we take a step back and we look at the tools that Magritte used to make his work, paints, paint brushes, uh, specifically oil paints for that painting, uh, the treachery of images. Um, it's, it's less clear that you know, there's a story and an intent and an ideology behind you know, what's, what's being made. Um, and I would argue that that has translated to the digital as well. Uh, this is an amazing animated GIF by this uh, motion graphics artist, J.R. Canis. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and uh, you know, he, he uses digital tools to make these animations, and they're just so full of character and, and um, personality. But if you look at the tools that he used to make his work, I don't know if you guys are familiar with After Effects. Um, maybe not this particular version, um, but it, it's such a pragmatic tool that it, it loses a lot of this, these, these intentions, um, especially when it crashes which it happens often for me, because I have a, a pretty crappy MacBook. Um, so why is this exactly? Uh, I'm actually not here to tell you what the answer to this question is. But it is something that I am super interested in and have been kind of grappling with in my own kind of artistic explorations. Um, and it's this idea, this dichotomy of expression and utility. Uh, expression kind of the metaphor being you know, Magritte's pipe and the utility being the tools that he used to make his pipe. Um, and I'm super excited to be an artist working today because we have the advent of software. And software allows us to make tools that are also art. Um, and I, I, I'm arguing that KidPix here is, uh, you know, this is an early version of the software. Um, it, in of itself, as, as a UI and as a tool, is, is incredibly expressive. It has a lot of intention, um, and in some ways could be considered art. Um, but it's still a tool, uh, and I'm, I'm using it to kind of riff and remix Magritte's treachery of images here. Um, so all of a sudden, with, with the advent of software, we have this kind of muddling of this initial dichotomy that we've seen in fine arts. Um, and I would also argue that this has some sense in data visualization as well. Um, this kind of, just as an artistic piece, the genealogy of pop, rock, and music, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, as a, Tufty has popularized. Um, you know, as, a, as just a composition, aesthetically, it's like an interesting thing to look at, but it's also a tool. You can, you know, dive into the super graphic and find parts um, of kind of like music, musical eras that interest you and, and find, um, you know, what's relevant to you and how that is situated in the rest of the world, the world of music. Um, and in this way, 
expression and utility are muddled. Um, so I want to spend this next kind of half hour or so talking about expression, utility, and software through a couple projects that I've been working on um, really over the last 10 years. Uh, it's a space that I think is super unique and um, not something that a lot of people are exploring. And I think there's a lot of possibilities. This is, this is like the Wild West, I think, of, of today. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Jono. Uh, this is my website. My handle is J-O-N-O-B-R number one. Uh, yeah. I'm from San Francisco. It's really cold here. Uh, it was not, you know, on the, the temperature wise, it's like only five degrees cooler than SF, but it, it really feels a lot colder here. Um, but yeah, you can, you can usually find me riding my bike on the weekends. I like to not look at a computer screen when I'm not kind of making stuff. And if you're ever in San Francisco, hit me up and uh, love to, you know, go on a hike or something. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I actually went to school for graphic design at UCLA, uh, which is also where Lauren went. Maybe there's some other people here that went there. Um, the Design Media Arts program is really, really awesome program. It's, uh, in the, at least in the undergraduate program, uh, you kind of learn a lot of different disciplines uh, in, in how to communicate through design. So, you know, you learn graphic design and typography. This is a project I did, one of the first projects I did, kind of trying to uh, synthes uh, synthesize photography as typography and uh, kind of analyze the, a lot of the references and stuff. Uh, we also learned some data visualization. This is a public policy graph that I did that was kind of comparing a lot of uh, um, different um, publishing events um, in England, kind of which ones were popular or not. Um, we also got to do branding and identity. Uh, every summer, the high school students have the opportunity to come to uh, design media arts and try out a few different of the classes and then the undergrads and graduate students get to teach. Um, so I got to do the identity and then I was also a TA for the branding class. Uh, we get to do some film. Uh, I thought this one was particularly um, ripe for all the people that work on the web. Uh, I made a video in college called wearethenter.net. It's still online. It's in Flash. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it, it was coming up to the internet's 37th birthday, and so we made a documentary. We went from the art department, which is in North Campus, down to the south department where the computer science people were in uh, Bolton Hall, and uh, looked at one of the first servers that ever existed and interviewed people on the way, and it was like, how did the internet change your life? It's a pretty college-y project. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then there's, there's a lot of other stuff that you kind of get to grapple with. So, you know, if anybody of you are thinking about going to school or have kids that are thinking about going to school, I would highly recommend going here. Um, if for none of those other reasons, I was introduced to this while I was there. And uh, Lauren uh, McCarthy, who spoke earlier, she kind of touched on this probably better than I could ever. Um, but Casey Reese, who's one of the professors at UCLA, he... Um, uh, he teaches this class called interactivity, and he uses processing to teach that class. Um, and so this is this is what it looks like. It's just this kind of sandbox environment where you can write little instructions. You hit the little play button in the upper left-hand corner, and then a window pops up with you know your drawings, and you can do animations and a lot of really crazy stuff. Um, the one class that really kind of got me hooked on programming. I, I had done some stuff before, but I hadn't really. Um, Dug, dug deep into it and, and really understood the potential of it um, was this class called Visual Music. And the premise of the class was a 10-week course where we were given a song um, that was like not like a pop or rock song, but something a little bit more avant-garde. And we spent the 10 weeks kind of trying to emotionally distill what the song was about and then write a program that would run in real time that would represent that. Um, so to embarrass myself, as this seems the nature of this conference. <laughs> I'm gonna show you my first programming project. Also, okay. Um, so, yeah, over the course of the 10 weeks, you know, we learned about four statements and arrays and classes. I didn't use any of those. <laughs> um, 
basically just a really long, like maybe like 2,000 line document of just if statements, like if millis is greater than this, kind of draw this thing and like copy the function over and over again. Um, so yeah, you know, it kind of changes scenes and progresses. I'm not going to show the whole thing because there's a lot of stuff I want to cover. Um, but this this was really seminal and kind of like making me realize that I I was interested in animations growing up, but I was kind of discouraged by hand cell drawn animations because it's it's such a tedious process. And this particular project was very tedious because I was handwriting everything. But I realized the potential that you know you could abstract a lot of this stuff. Um, to, to create a, like systems and rules to kind of dictate your animations. Um, so after I graduated college, the left arrow just made me play head. Um, after I graduated from college, I uh, continued kind of messing around with this idea of visual music, messing around with processing these real-time kind of effects, so taking in audio data or using computer vision, um, exploring different techniques, but then also exploring different aesthetics, different compositions, different color palettes, things that I thought you know, were interesting or appropriate for the various songs. So I want to show just a little montage of stuff that I, would wor I was working on for three years uh, in my free time. <laughs> if it loads. Oh my gosh. You can do it. To these Google Docs slides. Oh my God. Um, no you can do it. I have everything else loaded. Okay, here we go. Um, so the format is that uh, the label is the artist that I'm making a visualization for and the year that uh, I made it. So compression was kind of tough on that, but hopefully you get an idea of, um, you know, kind of the ideas and techniques that I was kind of grappling. And during that time, I did learn how to properly use arrays and classes and also leverage GL. And um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And I, I kind of kept a blog about that and um, kind of uh, took, took a break a little bit from these visual music projects because I, I had an opportunity to work at Google and what I thought would kind of really refine my programming chops. Um, so, kind of fast forward a couple years, and um, this nonprofit organization that's uh, an art and technology kind of community center in San Francisco approached me and was like, hey, we've seen your blog, we've seen you make a lot of really cool music visualizations. Um, would you be interested in making one for the show that we have coming up? They do events and workshops and uh, 
have exhibitions and stuff. It's a, it's a really cool space and opportunity, and I couldn't say no. Um, and kind of in the discussion, what they wanted to do was something really collaborative. Um, and kind of a lot of the previous work that I had was leveraging a lot of FFT, trying to do like beat sampling and all this like kind of algorithmic stuff. Um, and in, in these discussions, realizing the collaborative, collaborative aspect, uh, we kind of realized that, okay, maybe I should, should try to not use those. Uh, and maybe there's just a way that, you know, we could really put the person in the forefront of this. Um, so, I'm going to try to demo this two-year-old, three-year-old software right now. Um, hopefully, I can exit this slideshow. There we go. Um, okay, and so as you can see, it's running in the browser. Uh, this is to a song, Culprit. Uh, the artist's name is Culprit. Um, so here we go. If it loads. Glad that still works. Whew. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the, that, that's the software. But actually, the setup for it, if I can go back to full screen. Um, hello. OK. Um, it was actually set up on a monome, 
uh, which is a MIDI controller with a bunch of buttons on it. And so we put it in the center of the audience and let anybody mess around with it. I wasn't the person that was in charge of making the visuals. The audience was. Um, and this reception was like incredibly profound to me uh, because nobody had ever been like, oh my god, that was like amazing uh, to my work before. So I, I kind of I started thinking like, wait a second, um, maybe this project isn't done with, with this format. Um, so kind of, uh, I took a break from that for a year, um, and I, I, would, you know, I listen to a lot of music when I do work, and I thought, you know, maybe I could just hit an artist up and see if they would be interested. Um, so this is a band, Lullatone. They're from Nagoya, Japan. And I didn't, well, I didn't know them um, prior to emailing them. This is the email that I sent on November 27, 2013, which was basically like, oh my god, I love you guys so much. Uh, I do have a job, so I could pay you, um, but hopefully you'd be interested in collaborating with me and making sounds to, you know, create kind of a standalone application. Um, and they responded. It was it was kind of the start of a collaboration, um, which was super exciting. Uh, but I didn't realize that this was really just the beginning of a collaboration. Um, so we made this app called Patatap. Uh, you can probably maybe you guys have seen it. Uh, I won't take too long to demo it, but basically every key on your keyboard when you go to the app is a different sound and animation. So this is Q, this is W, E, R, T, Y, and these are like all of them together. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, so we, we started working on this. The process was, you know, he sent me a bunch of sounds, and I was like, oh my god, these sounds are incredible. Uh, and I was like, uh, these animations I've made are not cool enough. Like, let me make more. And we kind of went back and forth for about six months making stuff and then editing stuff down and trying to reduce something to what we thought uh, would be an octopus. No, uh, would be something akin to an acoustic uh, instrument. We wanted to make something that was easy to pick up and play, but was not necessarily like a DAW that you would be, that would be kind of your whole creative suite for making something. This was just a little piece, you know, Kind of like Jeff's talk at the beginning, this, this is one piece in a very big ecosystem of creating music. And we were hoping to help you know, a small group of people make stuff. Um, what we didn't realize is that this thing would blow up. Uh, this is this guy. He's, he's the most famous vlogger in France. His name is Cyprien. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, like, yeah, after, after he sent this, like, the servers crashed and everything kind of went <laughs> haywire. Uh, it was on the front page of Reddit and all this stuff. And um, it, was, it was so great to see, you know, people really like it. But it was also really interesting to see the different types of ways people make something that, you know, we had been basically collaborating over the Internet for six months, and I had been kind of working on this thing for a year. Uh, it was like, holy crap, people use stuff a lot. <laughs> Um, so one way was that you know people just tried it out. Uh, another way was that people would try it and then they would share it. And you know individuals from our communities, the music community, the web community, other people would share stuff. But also entities and organizations would share stuff. And I found this really, I find this interesting in general about social media is that entities specifically, you know, they have a voice and usually one person is in charge of of their. Uh, PR campaign or whatever. So you get really interesting stuff like this. Like Wired published an article about Patatap, uh, and it says, get this rad portable animation, whatever. And it's really small, you can't really see it, but VentureBeat at replies like, I am so unfollowing you for that gnarly animated GIF. And then Wired responds, N O O O O O O O exclamation point, which sounds like so out of tone for an entity like Wired. It, it was interesting to see kind of like, oh, there's a human behind that, you know? And likewise, unfortunately, social media also kind of automates and roboticizes individuals sometimes. This uh, Jason David unfortunately took the embed code and just <laughs> stuck it into a tweet. Um, so that's, that's our bad for making a bad UI that wasn't explicit. Like, this is for a Tumblr or a blog or not Twitter. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, we, we also saw you know, these entities write kind of long form articles about the work. This, this, this was an awesome article from Killscreen that was basically saying how these ungames, there's a huge corpus of them, Patatap was one of the ones in this article, um, are really great for kind of jogging your creative energy. 
Um, we also have a, a merch page. Uh, if you go to the site, Patatap, there's like this UI at the bottom. If you hit merchandise, uh, you can actually buy artwork that we make. Uh, Lelatone has a bunch of albums that they produce. I make you know, print posters. And then you can also buy, we have an iPhone app and an Android app, um, which I also want to promote. Uh, we used this thing called Mobile Chrome Apps. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with making Chrome extension, but basically you make a normal website, you package it with a manifest JSON, um, and that becomes a Chrome extension. So this, this group at Google has also created a command line tool that you can take that same manifest format, and it creates an Xcode project and an APK for you. Um, and it was dead simple. Uh, well, the, the actual like coding part was dead simple. The, the whole other like authoring and like key signing and stuff is like a huge pain in the butt. But um, so yeah, if any of you are interested in making apps and converting your HTML5 apps or whatever, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm just gonna try to skip through this. This guy, Robert Honey, actually uh, used Patatap with Logic Pro to kind of create his own music. Uh, so he, he sings over it. Tap my heart can flutter. Tap, tap, I don't want you no more. Anyways, you can wait for the single. I think it's coming later this fall. Um, and then also in other communities, uh, we've seen tons of stuff on SoundCloud and Instagram. If you just search for Patatap or do a hashtag search, it's crazy to see. Most of it is just people messing around, but occasionally, like this magazine, Animal New York, made like a really sick beat with it um, that then another rapper used uh, as a sample to, to rap on top of it. Um, people also do really crazy stuff with hardware. This is uh, this woman, Camille Martin, I think from France. And uh, she had her thesis project, which was an Arduino that had this box where you could touch it and kind of uh, use that as some kind of input. And she hooked it up to Patatap, so you could make, you know, Patatap beats with her. I think it's called a mysterious sound box. Um, and then you have people actually augmenting our code. This is the craziest thing about the internet. Um, this guy basically wrote a little bit of JavaScript that I'm just gonna get, copy, and then paste into the console of of the site, and now we have a sequencer. <laughs> and now I can just, you know, make beats, save them, and play them, uh, change the BPM. Uh, it's really crazy to see like what people do with stuff when you, when you put it out there. Um, how do I close? I'm just gonna close it. Sorry, dude. Um, oh. Uh, so yeah, and then finally, we actually, we've been invited for installation. So uh, museums and art organizations ask us, hey, is it okay if we use this thing and install it in X? And we're like, yeah, we don't have to do anything? That's rad. Yeah, if you could just send us a video, we're happy to share it online or whatever. Uh, so this was in Slovenia in January. Uh, they had it set up at this music festival, Ment. Um, and these are the different places that it's been over the world physically installed. You know, it's really crazy to think you make software and it's stuck in this screen. Uh, but with the help of all these people and organizations, we've actually been a lot of places, like physically a lot, like here. I'm standing in front of you probably because of this project. Um, so this is, the, this is the first time I'm actually sharing any of the analytics. Uh, this is the time spent on Patatap in the first month. And you can see there's like a huge spike for the first 10 seconds. There's basically three quarters of the traffic look at it for 10 seconds or less. Um, but if you look down at the bottom, almost 10,000 sessions uh, use it for half an hour or more, which I think is a scarier number. Um, but I, I wanted to juxtapose this with what I was just showing you because these numbers, this data is actually less relevant than the kind of interactions and discourse that I just showed you. The people that try it, they share it, they review it, they purchase it, they support us as artists, uh, they make recordings, they do music production, they augment it with hardware, they augment the code, uh, or they install it. They do so much cool stuff. Uh, and that is way more powerful than any you know, million milestone number, in my mind. Um, so this project kind of sits somewhere in this uh, dichotomy of expression and utility. And one other way that we've seen that is through a lot of email discourse, literal discourse. Uh, so I'm gonna share some emails with you. This one, and this helps if you're actually following uh, along in the doc, because I'm not actually gonna read these. 
but this was from a Ukrainian electroacoustic musician who he and his friends have this like jam session every week and they use pad tap once and it's amazing because this was around the same time that kind of the really heavy stuff in Ukraine was hitting last year and it's it's cool to see that you know we could play a part in kind of helping relieve at least a little of that tension for people that are actually there. Um, people have different backgrounds. This is a filmmaker from New York City. Uh, he was like, hey, I want to make a video of you using Patatap. So we made a video. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, sure, why not? Um, a lot of different interests. We got a lot of emails from students that were like, hey, I'm an illustration student. I'm a musician student. Is it cool if I use your samples? Is it cool? How, how do you do this thing? How do you get started? Um, kind of doing a lot of just sharing, knowledge sharing uh, has been really, really fun. And then randomly we also get like occasional economic uh, backgrounds. Somebody, like the day before my birthday last year, just sent me $500 and it just says, thanks for making Patatap. Sweet, thanks dude. Um, that's really great because our server costs were actually kind of expensive uh, because I'm a bad programmer or something. Uh, so yeah. And then we've also been in contact with other industries. Uh, a lot of record labels have been in, in touch with us because they want to sign us to do music or you know, do some other kind of advertising-based website. Uh, it's really opened up a lot of opportunities for collaboration. Um, so yeah, kind of going back to these hard numbers versus this qualitative stuff. Here's more, this is the last year in traffic. It's normalized, so you don't know how many exactly. But basically, you know, it, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't, tell that much, except that those are the two front times we're at the front page of Reddit. Um, so Reddit really is the front page of the internet. But other than that, it, it's, you know, it's really um, kind of these other types of discourse interactions that we've had that have been really powerful. Um, but those, those don't stop with that project. Um, actually, uh, I use a lot of tools in order to make a project like this. Um, some of those are off the shelf. Uh, I use Bourbon and jQuery. People, I don't know why, but they like really hate me for you still using jQuery. I think it's a great library. Um, and actually, the guy who did the sequencer wouldn't have been able to do it if we didn't have some uh, arbitrary event binding system, like the jQuery events, that you could spoof events. So shame on you who hate me for using <laughs> jQuery. Um, I also augment libraries. There's this really cool library. It's hard to see here, but it's, it's called tween.js. There's a lot of tween.js's. This one is by... Uh, GitHub user Sole, um, and it's kind of uh, formatted from the Flash days, uh, but I've kind of forked it and augmented it a little bit because the syntax, I, I like a particular set of syntax. And then I also make custom software, and so I want to introduce 2JS. Um, it's, a, it's a rendering environment, so all of the drawing, the shapes that were drawn, are using 2JS. It's a scene graph, but you get to what's what's unique about it is that you can choose SVG Canvas or WebGL uh, as your rendering system. And then also the API is something that I find is much more friendly than more performant libraries like Pixie or something like that. Um, so this is the website. It kind of gives an overview and then kind of initial first steps. This is how much the code is, you know, to make this thing. And then it also has just documentation for all the methods and properties and stuff. And then we also have a page that shows the projects and examples. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, go to the issues on GitHub. We have a Stack Overflow hashtag, but I don't get an email when that happens, but I get an email when the issues are posted, so feel free to post questions there. Um, these are the examples. They're kind of based off of 3.js. I, I do contribution on 3.js. It's kind of how I learned a lot of the stuff that I know about rendering. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't go over these. Um, but I will go over, oh, at the bottom, there's more like a list of more utility-based examples. Also, all these examples are less than 150 lines of code. I made a big deal to like make it kind of bite-sized, not like, here's a thing, and it's 2,000 lines, it's massive. Um, so there's one, this one down at the bottom, blank. I actually use this a lot. I don't know if, if any of you guys use Python. I find the console with a loaded library very similar to IPython. Basically, I have an instance of two that already exists, so I can see what this is. If I hit period, I can see all the methods and properties that exist with it. So 
I already know the library, so I'm gonna make a rectangle. It has a bunch of make methods. I can put it in the middle of the screen, um, and I'll make it 50. So there it is. And the rectangle now, you get that return because it's a scene graph. You have this object that persists from frame to frame. Um, so it has a bunch of properties too. Uh, it has a translation. Let's move it over 50 pixels. It also has like a fill, kind of normal um, CSS stuff that you'd expect. Um, I really like this pink right now. Um, yeah, it, you know, I don't like the stroke. I don't know why I have default stroke. I followed Illustrator, but. Anyways, um, but what was I gonna do? Oh yeah, so it also has a matrix. So we can rotate this 45 degrees. Um, and if we kind of bring that down, if I kind of added, additively do it, we start to see animations. Um, and so we have a function that you can do that programmatically instead of having to do it um, every, every frame yourself. It's hard programming when you're nervous. So now it spins. Um, so that's kind of the basis of it. And you can see that uh, Padatap is heavily influenced by the kind of structure that this framework provides. Uh, one thing that it is really good with that, I'm, that I haven't showed that maybe I should show an example is it's really easy to morph vertices. So I have a, I have a notion of where your verts are all the time. So if you move a vert, I got you covered. And I have a method that uh, keeps your curve, so you don't have to calculate curves, which is really cool and helpful for a lot of these more animated stuff. Um, so yeah, why would I make a tool when so many other people make tools and organizations, really, um, and I'm just a dude? Uh, one reason is for edification. I know the W3C spec on SVG Canvas and WebGL so well right now. It's, it's not even funny. Um, the other is community participation. So uh, this example is actually really cool. This guy, I had initially written the children as a map, and he made it an array and wrote all the unit tests for it. It's like, what the, awesome. I just have to hit OK? That's amazing. Um, but what I really mean by community participation is that I've learned, I, I never took a computer science class. I've learned everything that I know just kind of from the internet and also from Casey Reese and processing and that, that community. And uh, it's one way to give back kind of the knowledge that I've learned over the last 10 years, really, um, because I, I've seen so many people that have, that, that should have had the opportunity that I had, but for whatever reason, I'm here and they're not. Uh, so part of it is for, for those people and other strangers that are interested to learn, and I'm happy to help and answer questions uh, in any way that I can. Um, so this is an example of good participation. This is an example of bad participation. Somebody's basically like, hey, this is cool, but it's broken. And I'm like, oh, OK, what's the operating system or browser you're running? No response. Helpful. And then there's just the ugly. I got this from CamJG71. This is really boring. And then a few minutes later, I get an email notification. Oh, she updated her post. What did it say? It's no better. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is, is uh, reusability. So over the course of working at Google and then also making side projects for myself, I've written kind of from scratch rendering systems and also a lot of the other stuff that makes kind of certain things really, really fluid and nice. Particularly this one called Fit to Window, it takes the DOM element, stretches it to the canvas, makes sure that there's no scroll bars, and reduced it to a full screen parameter. And it's a lot of kind of like over the course of using or writing something a lot, you're like, man, I can make this a lot easier, which is something you can't do in a lot of industries. Um, and it's, it's pretty empowering to try to tighten, tighten your loop. Um, so yeah, I think these kind of three properties have a, have a really good kind of symbiotic relationship that help you, A, understand the content and technology that you're working with, and result in a, in a more kind of tactful, approach in, in how you make content and express yourself um, through your work. Um, and then to kind of like cap off the section, you know, I, I bring in this graphic again because it's, I have a whole other set of dialogue and discourse that I'm interacting with people on. You know, we have the stuff from Padatap, but then the engine that runs Padatap, people are actually making other stuff. And if I had more time, 
I could spend like an hour just showing off the stuff that people, other people have made. Um, but you know, we, have, we have different types of discourse. And um, I kind of want to end with you know, discourse is at least why I work in this, tech, in this medium. It's a, it's a way for me to talk to people. It, it's not like I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm not a very social person, but I am deeply interested in humanity. And, um, you know, at, at, in any crafts kind of, oh, I'm sorry, I go to this slide. At any crafts um, kind of like highest point, I think it's, it's an expression, an idea that sparks discourse. And, and that's something that I'm super interested in. So whether it's Rene Magritte that paints a painting, or my friend Camille who creates a digital version of the pipe, or my friends Fogbeast who dance a version of the pipe, or uh, my buddies Ecole de Curiosité that do fashion design that kind of represents the pipe, or my mom who writes a haiku about the pipe, or my friend who does kind of high level microscopic photography about the pipe, or my other friend who just likes coffee um, or typography, uh, or me who uses code. Does anybody know what this will look like when it runs? <laughs> um, and with that, I want to say thanks.